A couple of weeks ago I spoke about the exhibition Esthesia, which opened at the Resolution Gallery in Yansmuts Avenue, part of the art strip just across the road really from this radio station. It opened on the 27th of October, running until the 31st of January, and the artist is Andre S. Clements, who joins me now in the studio. Good morning, Andre. Good morning, Michael. Good morning to the listeners. I have to ask you, what is the S? Uh, the S is a little initial I put when I changed my name when I got married, actually. So it doesn't stand for anything, and as you can imagine, it was interesting convincing home affairs to just put a letter in my name, but that's the S. Well, I was fascinated by that, because the same thing is true of Harry Truman, the American president. His name was just Harry Truman when he was christened, and on all forms that you have to fill in, they want a middle name, and he didn't have a middle name, so he thought, what shall I do? I just put in an initial, and for some reason he chose the same initial as you. He chose the S. Well, um, I didn't know that. Thanks for telling mm. me that. But I thought mm. the S is probably the most beautiful letter in the alphabet, so that was a good start. Um, and, of course, my wife's um, maiden name was Swat, so the S ah. uh, rever uh, referred to that as well. Mm. Mm. Yes, I doubt if uh, Harry Truman was uh, had the same motivation. He, uh, was a, he was a shopkeeper from Illinois. I don't think artistic imagination <laughs> was his thing. Anyway, uh, aesthesia, that's, uh, it sounds like a, a combination of anesthesia and aesthetics. Uh, I assume it's a made-up word. What, uh, what does it mean? Well, you're quite right. Um, it does relate to anesthesia, and I, I think it's very interesting that you uh, mention the word anesthesia, and people don't know what it means, but everybody knows what anesthesia means. Mm. Um, and um, anesthesia is not actually a made-up name. It, it is the original concept or term that uh, the word anesthesia was based on as the opposite. So what does it mean? It's not enough <laughs> just to say it's the opposite <laughs> of anesthesia. It, for me, it means, I mean, in the first place, it's a title of an exhibition. So in that, it's, it's a name and what is a name. Mm. Um, for me, it, it refers very much to the ability to sense or perceive. And as I think you've seen in a lot of my work, um, I try to push the boundaries of how much can you perceive and sense in a, in a single static image, for example. Well, your work is very elusive uh, and elusive in, in both similar words and uh, uh, the images almost uh, come out of the mist at you and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a photographic based technique but you do produce results which are um, similar in many respects to some of the great artists in oil. How have you developed this process? Well when I set out to develop um, this body of work close on 10 years ago now um, one of my intentions was to try and um, integrate or reconcile you know, more traditional mediums, schools, techniques, uh, and aesthetics for that matter, with the more contemporary things like generative art, photographic art. Um, and then at the same time, I feel in a lot of my works, I try to almost wage a war between realism and abstraction um, and find some kind of a middle ground that that, like I say, includes and transcends those conventions. Now, this is not straight photography, although it is a photographic medium. Is it multiple exposures, or do you do a lot of work in the dark room? How do you go from a, a fairly realistic photographic portrait to the sort of almost impressionist approach that uh, comes out in the final work? Yes, it is very much based on um, the conventions of multiple exposure photography. But whereas in the old days, in a traditional dark room, you'd battle to do more than three or four exposures and um, be accurate in terms of how much to show of each of those exposures. In the digital paradigm, I can use as many exposures as I like and find a true average. And this is one of the interesting things about the work. All of them are based on averages of images. So, for example, if I take two photographs each of the last six presidents of South Africa, and I find a mathematical true average of all those images. What does that look like? So you put the faces together, put the faces and, and you together. do this on, well, it wouldn't be paintbox, but some, some similar computer program. So you very much work uh, with a computer digital very playing around, you know? Very much so. Um, you know, um, someone like Harald Richter, for example, is already almost relegated the tradition of painting to what used to be the sketchbook. David Hockney has done the same for the camera. 
Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting to start pushing those boundaries and say, you know, is there really a, a boundary between camera and painting and etching, printmaking, and so on? You have a very different approach from Hockney, though, because I've seen quite a lot of Hockney's photographic work, and he uses it almost to heighten reality. You blur and soften reality. Well, at first glance, the retina burn of these images do seem softened and they do seem blurred. But if you think uh, about it on a conceptual level, um, there's a sense in which these images are almost hyper-real or meta-real in that the painterly qualities you get are not an expression of my whims as the artist directly anyway. They are emergent properties of the reality that's been recorded and uh, overloaded in technical terms. Now, as I've said before, to me, many of the work has... Um um, no, I wouldn't say references, but it reminds me of people like, and they may sound very different, but uh, both Rembrandt and the Impressionists. Is this uh, anything conscious, or is this just the way the technique works itself out? I think it's certainly part of, or achieving something like that is certainly part of my intention. Um, when you think, for example, of the composer series, where I've created an average of the most famous composers um, of each of the eras of um, classical composition and music, going back to the Renaissance, um, I've used images in that case taken from Wikipedia. So it's paintings from that era that have now been, you've taken 30 or 70 or 100 of those photographs and or paintings and superimposed them. And in a sense, you start getting an average of that era's representation of the artist. So, for example, when you look at the piece on romantic composers, you can almost smell the absinthe. Mm. There's, there's mm. And the, the color tones are reminiscent of daguerreotypes and early uh, black and white photography. Um, so it's not an empirical exercise, but there's certainly something of that uh, empirical reality that filters through into the final work. It's interesting how those um, environments, if you like, of a time will, will come through this sort of process, isn't it? I mean, people pretty much look the same. You or I would have looked the same 200 years ago, but put a group of us together and there is very much a, a period style or appearance. Absolutely, and there's, there's, there's something of the culture and the conventions that also emerge mm. out of that. The, the type of poses that were appropriate for composers, you know, for example, in the 1400s versus today. Mm. And you were saying you can actually take up to a hundred images to um, compress or distill into one of your pictures? Well, to give you an idea, um, at the top end of the, of the spectrum of superimpositions in this show, I've got the 20th century classical composers. Now, there I chose to take 256 composers, or their representations, um, and then superimpose that. But I take that through five different processes of alignment. First aligning on one eye, then another eye, in order to synthesize this new body or this new figure out of that information. So eventually the 20th century composers is built up out of 1,280 individual position superimposed layers and finding the true mathematical average of that. And there must be an element of subjectivity in this. It can't be quite as formulaic as you say, taking the one eye, the other eye, the nose, the mouth. There, there must be, a, as I say, some sort of subjectivity. There, there absolutely is, and I think uh, it's important for me to try and find uh, a meaningful balance between the formulaic or the generative and the actual expressive. Um, a lot of that, though, impacts on um, the, the original intention and the images that you source and then the t decisions you make. Because I literally, I could write a program to go and do this, but the result would be just a blur. Mm. I literally sit there for hours putting one image on top of another, zooming it in on each pixel and you know, manually going and p um, positioning the eye in the right place, for example. Um, it actually becomes quite eerie when you're looking at all these people in the faces and studying all their details mm. in order to decide how and find how to build this new figure. Now you say you sit there for hours, but just how many hours? It must be hugely time-consuming. Well, the, the 20th century composers that we're talking about, I worked on for three weeks, um, all the available time I had, so that, that, that's a bit of time. It's as long as an oil painting. Um, it dries much faster. Yes, but no, I make the point because people think that uh, you know photography is an instant medium, and uh, mm. you you don't spend the time in the studio unless you manipulate it. But it certainly wouldn't take as long as uh, as a classical oil painter. But in fact, that really isn't true, is it? 
not at all. Um, for me, there's, I, I, I really don't see much difference anymore between the, the traditional um, processes and the more contemporary uh, tools that are available because there are just tools. And yes, there are a lot of things that they make faster, but the things that really matter, they tend to not be quick and easy. Mm. So what do you do next? Surely not just more of the same. I mean, obviously you'll want to, to build on this exhibition. Uh, the technique is, is too demanding just to throw away and move on to something else, but presumably you're going to want to do something a little different. Yeah, I don't think I'll ever completely abandon the technique. Uh, there are a couple of other projects that I'm busy working on. Um, but the technique in itself, like I alluded to earlier for me, is really just a tool. It's a technique. Mm. At the end of the day, that's not what really matters. It's, it serves a purpose. Um, you mentioned the traditional painting. I am also developing a body of work in traditional oil on canvas um, and have been for a while, but it, you know, like I say, that takes a long time to dry. Mm. Okay, well, so it sounds as if you're not going to be exhibiting any uh, anywhere just yet. It's going to take a while to develop another show, which is uh, not a bad thing necessarily. Um, I think so. I have another life that allows me to engage with the artistic practice in, in my own terms mm. and I'd rather do a show that I know is is the real thing so to speak. Well I think the show at the Resolution Gallery at the moment is very definitely the real thing. It's called Esthesia. The artist is Andre S. Clements and he has been my latest guest.